Hey guys, hello, welcome back on the channel. Thank you so much for your donations. Thank you so much for your likes. And also I have to tell you that after like almost four months since we published the first video, we got even the first unlike. Thank you so much as well. Uh, speaking of uh, tonight's lesson, I first want to tell you that all of these uh, files, lectures from these videos, uh, you can actually get on my site www.bigmaya.com. Go on downloads and uh, find out more how can you get the PGNs of every single file. I also want to tell you uh, that tonight I'm very excited because uh, I'll present how to play against Colorado Gambit. Well, uh, I got like more than seven requests, individual requests by guys who asked me, Maya, please show us how to play against this fashionable variation. The Colorado Gambit is an aggressive uh, line where black tries to weaken his kingside pawn structure in return for some deadly attacks against white. Uh, it was used by Germans mainly, uh, Grandmasters, Taskesh, Neider, Fabian Dettling and many more. Uh, even though many YouTube weeds and players claim this is a solid opening for black, I'm, I claim it's complete trash and could only work maximum twice a surprise opening against the players that haven't studied it at all. Uh, definitely. Uh, since you're going to study after this lesson, you're gonna uh, like me a lot. From another point of view, Colorado fans and supporters, after this video, uh, you're gonna hate me very much. So let's get started. E takes f5. We live in the 21st century. Whoever plays Gambit, take it, but of course, learn how to refute it. E takes f5. Okay. Uh, just like I told you, since we're talking about the dubious gambit, we should accept and refute it straightforward. After d5, they just want to get the pawn back with the bishop on f5. Here we play a very important move, bishop b5. Developing bishop, preparing for a castle and fighting over e5 square afterwards. Now you're probably wondering why and how. So after bishop f5, we go with one of the most important moves of the whole opening. Knight comes to e5. This move of such a high importance, it doesn't only pin the knight on c6, uh, but shows the real importance of control of dark squares afterwards. So let's get started. After knight e5, this position can be divided in three ways. So they can play queen d6, the main line. They can play a6 and bishop d7. Let's get started with bishop d7. Uh, which presents a kind of a classic approach by many players in this opening. I'm not going to tell you uh, why you shouldn't play one thing or another. I don't want to tell you what's wrong if you play uh, some other move with the white pieces. I'm just going to show you all the time the best moves for white. So, bishop takes six six. Uh, in many of these positions, you'll actually realize that the knight on e5 is way better than this bishop. And here, unlike my most of previous suites, where I actually spoke about the bishop pair advantage, here we're not going to have that bishop pair advantage anymore. I don't care about the light square bishop. I want to uh, take it away uh, for the knight. And actually, we want to play like that. So after bishop c6, we go for castles. I just want to point out, look at the knight on e5, look at the bishop on c6. Don't ask me, why don't you play queen h5 here? Queen h5 is something that you go into very big mess. Uh, then you just risk to go uh, into very, very big difficulties. And just like I told you, I'm showing you how to play and treat these positions. After knight f6, d4, of course, uh, you're even more showing to your opponent how you're actually going to treat this light square bishop that really looks weak. They have two ways. They can play g6 and e6. Uh, most of these uh, German GMs, they go with e6. But if they, or if anyone ever against you play g6, go with knight takes c6. Uh, you just run the pawn structure and now they have lots of troubles 
also with this backward pawn on e7 and the hole on e6. So after bishop f4, bishop g7, a uh, move that is so important is bishop e5. Now, uh, you just want to get rid of the bishop on g7 if they ever move that knight from f6. So you don't want to uh, take the knight away from f6. You just keep your bishop on e5 so they cannot move the knight. And finally, uh, we play knight d2. This is the first time uh, tonight we see this highly important move. I'm just always going to talk about the necessity of knight coming to d2. Of course, this knight can go to b3, so it's control of squares on a5 and especially c5. Then your rook can go and open e5, rook e1, queen goes on e2, white is much better. If in that position they go with e6, you once again go with knight takes e6, b takes e6, and guess what? For the second time in this lesson, I insist on the flexibility of knight d2 move. Uh, it gives white c4 followed by queen a4 where we would just attack the pawn on c6. Pretty easy game along the c file. Possibility to go with c4 and c5 to chase away the bishop on d6 if it comes there. Then you also have rook c1 with further support on c6 pawn. And finally, uh, you can just afterwards sometimes go with that knight on f3 and e5. Although be careful because sometimes if you leave control of e4 squared, knight from f6 could come on e4. So after knight e2, if they play bishop d6, you play that important move c4. After castle c5, and now they can go with the bishop on e7, which is very passive square for this bishop, and they can go with this bishop on f4. If they go bishop f4, knight f3, rook c1, you just play queen e2. What's the difference between knight? Oops, sorry. What's the difference uh, between knight that could come on um, e5, so I'm talking about knight on f3, and knight uh, from f6 that coming on e4? Knight on e5 can never be, uh, you know, like chased away by any of black pieces, unlike knight on e4 by black that can always be kicked off with f3. So just because of this, after c5, they sometimes play this bishop e7 move, which I consider to be extremely suspicious. You go rook e1, attacking pawn on e6. They play queen d7, knight f3, knight e4, knight e5, queen e8, and there we go. We actually kick that knight away with f3 and get like full control of the e-file. Uh, potential weaknesses on c6 and e6 with the rook on e1, with the queen coming on a4. And this is a very, very difficult position for black. Uh, this lecture could be very uh, difficult. Uh, for many of you who are just beginners at chess or just like low rated guys because I will insist on like this is trash opening and this is refutation. This is not like one of those refutations where you win a piece or you just have like three pawns up or you just meet your opponent. No, it's like positionally refuted opening. So what I'm actually going to give you is like full control of the dark squares of important, uh, you know, like control of the strong outposts, uh, inability by black to defend these weak outposts, just like in this case e6 and f6. Apart from bishop d7, which we've just considered, uh, we also can, I mean, black can go with a6. I told you already, give up bishop for the knight. And don't go for the pawns. No, you're not interested in material. You just want to actually control the dark square. So you play d4, queen d6, castles, knight f6, for the third time in this lesson, I'm asking you, what should you do? Well, knight comes to d2. Once again, knight, support c4, can go on b3 controlling c5. Uh, support sometimes knight d on f3 ideas, and basically knight on d2 is such a flexible move that refutes this opening in many variations. After knight e5, let's go with the main line, queen d6. It's played by most of these GMs and it's considered to be uh, the most reasonable alternative by black. So you play d4 and they go with knight f6. If they play a6, just out of curiosity, transposes in the previously seen variation a6 and once again our knight jumps on d2. 
So when they play like knight f6, we go castles, they go knight e7. Such an important moment of this variation. I'd like to stop here. They want to uh, unpin this knight on c6. They want to get rid of this strong knight on e5. Uh, they want to provoke you to uh, play some other moves. And there are so many moves, like bishop f4, rook e1, knight c3 that Movsassian played once. No, just actually carry on in the same fashion. So you give up light square bishop for the knight on c6. And always like this. So, uh, this move actually shows that the knight on e5 is way more important than the bishop here. Remember, control of the dark squares, that's the whole secret of this line. So, after b takes e4, you play bishop f4. Once again, an important move in the white strategy. Once again, you kind of force black to take on e5. And once again, we actually can go into three different lines. I've seen a couple of correspondence games where black went for a queen before. Led nowhere. It's extremely bad move. They threatened to take the b2 pawn, but uh, as far as you could have seen, we don't care about getting any material. We just go queen h5. It's more like computer move, because if they go with g6, you just move your queen, for example, uh, on h4, rook is hanging. So when they go and move the rook, you take on h7 and win some material. That's why they have to play bishop g6. And after bishop g6, you play queen h3. Uh, this is move that refutes uh, black's counter chances uh, at all. It stops forever e6. It gives f4, so e6 is impossible. It gives f4 and f5 uh, afterwards uh, to white. And uh, finally, this queen on h3, uh, which uh, I like so much, uh, gives us uh, also support of this knight on c3 or on a3 when needed. So when they take on b2, threatening this rook on b2, you play knight to a3. Uh, why is that so important? Because we kind of uh, threaten to trap this queen with the rook uh, h to b1. Take a look our, at our important queen on h3, defends the knight on a3. And now we threaten to win this. Uh, they can't take on c2 either, because uh, it doesn't seem to be working. And uh, finally, uh, when they play like queen to b7 or queen to b6, whatever, you just go with f4, uh, threatening to do f5 and fighting against this bishop on g6. Uh, it's terrible bishop. It has to go on e4 to save its position. Uh, it may even look not that bad at first glance, but now you come up with a beautiful move. Your knight comes to b1 and your knight goes toward c3, wants to chase away this bishop, wants to go toward c5 if possible. It is especially beneficial since the queen stands on h3 and they can play e6. After bishop c2, knight c3. Just like in any other final position. Black game looks positionally devastated. So look at it. Huge chaos in terms of harmony of black species. Inability to complete development. Not even talking about castling, of course. It doesn't exist. Gives uh, all these things. Uh, gives white practically easily positionally winning game. I insist on positionally because it's not tactically, it's not materially winning game, but they absolutely don't have a single move here. And when and after bishop e5, they can also go with queen g6. Queen g6 is kind of tempting uh, here by black. They threaten to take the pawn on uh, c2 with a tempi, but once again, you just go with a uh, old uh, fashion move c4. Once again, we threaten knight c3, queen a4, queen b3, followed by queen b7. White looks really good. Uh, I had one blitz game like this against some uh, I am uh, for fun in bullet. We, I played rookie one. The guy played bishop c4. I played knight e2, always this knight on d2. Bishop b5, a4, bishop a6, and I came up with this rook lifting an idea of sliding over the third rank and chasing away that queen. I won the game very easily. Actually, I made it the guy on e7 afterwards, and that was a nice attack. And finally, they can play third move, queen d7. Queen d7 is probably the most solid approach by most of the of these GMs. Uh, when I actually check the games, I've seen that they use the queen d7 the most. So what do we play after queen d7? 92. Now I'm about to show you game by Grandmaster Pavasovic from Slovenia, who uh, played 
such a nice positional game and actually refuted any counter chances and game for black here. So this is the sixth, seventh, eighth times uh, for the eighth time that we actually see that the knight comes to d2 after e6, knight b3, control of dark squares. No, uh, there is no possibility for these guys to do any c5, bishop d6, rook e1. It's very important when you fight against the backward pawn to be able to capture an e5 by piece. Here, that's rook. After castles, queen d2, rook a b8, rook e3. Such a nice move. This rook wants to be double up on the e files, but you also, when you double up your rooks, and when the e1 rook controls e5, because you need to take by piece, you just want to go with your rook from e3 to g3 into attack. Also, your knight want to jump on uh, c5 at some point. And after queen f7, you just go with rook a to e1, you just take a strong hold of the e5 square, a5, uh, are we interested in any material? Oh, by the way, we can't take by Quinn because they would just play bishop before, and that's, I believe, the only trick by black so far. You can't play knight a5 because of the same idea. But even if we could, we don't want to do that. Why would we do that? We play c3. Right now, we may take uh, actually on a5. So when they play like rook b5, a very nice move by Pavasovic, knight c5. He sacrifices this pawn uh, for complete control of the dark squares but what's the point if they don't do anything then uh, he's gonna take on d6 and take the pawn for nothing on e6 so black is forced to take on c5 uh, then he played rook to g3 threatening rook g7 here which was nice by the way bishop g6 of course don't hesitate uh, probably h4 followed by i don't know when you save and uh, Make sure that this one is not hanging probably after bishop d4, some queen g5 and h5. And finally, after g6 that happened in the game, he played bishop d4. He played queen e2, threatening queen e5. The guy played rook f to b8. He played queen e5, threatening mate on uh, h8. The guy played rook king f8, played rook f3 with the idea of g4. And when black tried the last trick with c5, Pavasovic played a4, removing the rook as defender on c5. In the best case scenario, black is just about to lose an exchange. He was completely lost <coughs> and this game was finished right now. I hope you enjoyed in this small presentation of how to positionally refute Colorado Gambit. Hope you're going to like this one. You're going to have so much success. Um, and I just want to make a couple of conclusions. So let's make final conclusions. First one, Colorado Gambit is basically bad opening for black. Uh, there is no such thing like real refutation where you would end up being queen up or just few pawns up. Actually, positionally, they have lots of problems with strong outposts on the dark squares, mainly e5 and c5. Concrete moves. Uh, like bishop b5, where bishop should be given for the knight on c6. Bishop f4, where you just like take control of the strong e5 square. And finally, such a crucial move like knight d2, where that knight goes to either uh, b3, f3, support c4, uh, all together with a rook on e1, where you mostly go after the backward pawn on e6 and control e5. Those are the most important things. Finally, this positional refutation, don't take it for granted because it is mainly going to be applicable for advanced players, for good ones, for those who, cal who like calm positions and for all of you um, who are just familiar with like positional uh, types of games. Thank you so much. Keep supporting us and hope you enjoyed. Bye bye.